Hey guys, welcome. Uh, today we're going to look at Christina's kitchen remodel and talk about some of the lessons that she learned. Let's take it away. Today I am talking about kitchen renovations and specifically I want to talk about things that you need to avoid. I just know a little bit about this because I've done a kitchen renovation and some of these mistakes I've made and some of them I got right and I want to give you just some knowledge if you're thinking about doing a renovation, but don't get hung up on if you disagree. I, I would love it if you disagree. If you disagree, just leave it down below and we can have a little discussion, not a debate, a discussion. So um, after working with thousands of clients on kitchen remote projects, I would definitely um, endorse what Christine's saying here is um, learning from a homeowner who's gone through this is really valuable. Now, um, they will give you the insight perspective from their own experience. Um, it may not necessarily give you um, lots of perspective for decisions made in um, a variety of other settings, but at least they can share with you what they wish they would have done better, which is kind of what Christine is going to do here. So let's um, jump into this a little bit deeper. Mistake number one that I see people making when they're either building a home or a home renovation is they don't take the cabinets all the way to the ceiling. And I know why they do this. It's because it's expensive. Tall cabinets or custom cabinets, or in our case, you can see we did one cabinet and then another smaller one, and then we did crown molding on the top to make it go all the way to the ceiling. Um, I have 10 foot ceilings in this part of my house. And so, that was something that was important to me and my husband was to have it go all the way to the ceiling. But it's expensive and that's why people don't often do that. But I would urge you to splurge on that part of the kitchen, personally. There's also another kind of budget friendly way to go around this is to, in certain sections, don't have any cabinetry. Have it just open with the backsplash or add in open shelving. There's some beautiful examples of this um, on Pinterest. It just looks very custom, one of a kind when you do it that way. And then the places that you do have cabinets, because you saved a little bit on not putting them in this section, you just do more that go taller or that double on top of each other in other sections. And that's a good budget way to not increase the cost. And I think that actually gives you a more custom, special looking kitchen. I know um, Studio McGee does this a lot where she'll have like the hood and then she won't have cabinets right next to the hood. Um, so see how I have cabinets? cabinets on either side, should have it be empty with shelving. And sometimes it's empty all the way across with open shelves. And those are pretty inexpensive to do and quite stunning. And then on a different wall, she will have cabinets that go all the way up. Because you do need to have storage to put things away. But it gives such a custom high-end look when they go all the way to the ceiling. Some exceptions would be if you have vaulted ceilings, or like a loft, like really high ceilings. Obviously that's not, you're not gonna be able to do that. Yeah, listen, the, um... One of the great things about um, going to the ceiling is it gives your kitchen a complete um, uh, feel. You know, you're not um, compartmentalizing or breaking it up. Um, and I like how Christina gives you the options. Um, I would kind of break this into three three concepts. So um, the most expensive and yet the nicest look, um, oftentimes, is taking your cabinets to the ceiling. However, if your cap if your ceiling is really tall, let's say it's 11, 12 feet or taller, um, then a secondary option, which is less expensive, would be to, to make part of that ceiling um, height uh, accommodation out of a soffit. So let's say you have a 12 foot ceiling, maybe go a soffit down to say 10 or nine feet high. So I wouldn't take up more than a, th a quarter of the height of the room with the soffit. So max in that case, if it's a 12 foot ceiling, use up to three feet of that in soffit and then take your cabinets to the soffit. The next alternative as well would be to um, fill in that space with um, uh, paneling to build a soffit out of um, paneling that matches the cabinets. Um, so there's just a few variety of options there to keep your costs lower. But yes, very much now it's very popular to take your cabinets to the ceiling. Um, and now that we have taller ceilings, you may look at other accommodations to have that space fill, um, filled out without spending the money. Mistake number two is not taking the backsplash all the way up, or all the way to the side of the wall. Sometimes I see people stop the backsplash at like right at the edge and I just want it to keep going up. Or people will do like a backsplash here and then not take it all the way to the hood and I'm just itching to like push it back up. 
push it up to the top. And really, whereas the cabinets, that's an expensive thing to go all the way to the ceiling. Tile, unless you're choosing very high-end tile, most tiles are not that expensive, but it gives such an impact when it goes all the way up. You're already having the labor of someone installing it here. It's not gonna cost you that much more just to keep going. And I love when it is dramatic on like a whole wall, really stunning. Take the tile, be dramatic with the tile, go all the way up. Yeah, really great point, Christina. Um, one of the things to consider um, that, are, that is impacting this factor in today's kitchens is again, tall ceilings. Um, we want clean surface materials, so we don't want a lot of things to break up that space um, in large scale, let's say elements. Um, obviously grout lines or texture or pattern is okay, but, but to um, break it up in um, large sections such as a backsplash and then maybe you have, you know, your um, uh, spice holders or things like that. They kind of break up the lines uh, of that space. Or again, to have um, a partial backsplash and then a tile backsplash and then a line there as well. All of that adds to and maybe breaks up the room a little bit too much. I think we want clean. We want um, 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 a full space that feels to us light and bright and um, all encompassing. And again, we're dealing with large spaces now. Um, if you have too much in a large space, it can feel very busy. So I think that's what's driving the movement. One thing I will bring to your attention on um, backsplashes. One of the challenges of doing, say, a stone, a quartz countertop, and then bringing the, counter, the backsplash right down to the countertop is that joint is not um, very um, reliable from, from from cracking. So usually what I recommend is even a small splash, even if you should just do a one inch splash um, and have it um, um, epoxy to the same, the same material. So whatever your granite or quartz is, have that material uh, have a, a one inch or two inch splash just so that that joint is way less likely to crack and break if they epoxy that together and then tile from there on up. Um, it'll, it'll give you a nice clean corner to, to clean out of or to wipe down when you're maintaining the space, but it'll make it so that you're not having that very high likelihood of that backsplashing countertop joint breaking on you. Next mistake to avoid in a kitchen renovation is doing a double basin small dinky sink. No one can wash dishes in those. I don't know who's washing dishes, unless you're doing like, like you have the soaking in the soap and then the rinsing in the other, and you don't have a dishwasher, then fine. But if you have a dishwasher, there's no need to have, to, how much are you soaking? Don't soak, just use some elbow grease and get rid of the messiness and get a big old sink. And you can get really modern, you can get stainless steel, you can get black, white, you can get the, the farmhouse ones that have the apron, those are so pretty. So just get a big statement sink because then you can fit a lot more dishes in, it's much more functional and much more pretty. You can hide more dishes in there than the two double sinks. So unless you are washing your dishes by hand, even still I would urge you don't need the double sink. So one big old sink. Yeah, this is kind of an age old um, issue when it comes to design and, and selections. Um, the uh, the sinks, I would suggest um, a single bay or single basin sink is really great. Um, gives you a lot of flexibility. You're not um, restricted by that divider as Christina's stating here. So great advice. I definitely encourage it as well. Um, you might even look into some of the workstation sinks that have your um, cutting boards, your um, rinse trays, your um, colanders, your you know other features, um, all inclusive in the in the sink. Um, you know, package. Um, but, uh, you know, just make sure that it works for you. I mean, if you haven't had one before and you're used to a double basin sink, you may want to just um, see what you think about it. Uh, maybe use a neighbor or friend's sink <laughs> if you can arrange that and then uh, proceed to purchase one for yourself. Um, that might help. This is one where we didn't do it and we still might fix this down the line is if you're renovating your kitchen, make sure to build in the fridge. That gives such a high end look. And we kind of have, we have panels on one side and each side, but the issue was from our old house to this house, we brought our fridge and the fridge from our other house, we had deeper cabinets 
And so this fridge sticks out much further than the cabinets we have now. So here the fridge sticks out, which drives me crazy. So, and this fridge just won't die. It actually has been making crazy noises. So when that fridge dies, we're gonna get a fridge that sets back in more and that will give it a little more of the custom look where it's built in. But some people do this really well where they'll build in a fridge and I love that look. It just makes your whole kitchen look professional and custom, not fully custom built in. You can do it semi-custom. So that's definitely, yeah, the sticking out fridge is uh, definitely an issue in some settings. Some people don't like having those fridges intercede or inter interfere in the walkway space. Um, I've uh, got multiple other videos that address uh, the uh, fridge issue. There's lots of ways to handle that, like Christina has talked about, to make that inclusive. One way is to um, make your wall um, actually deeper just in that section where the fridge is at, so you can push the fridge back if it's a deeper fridge. You know, like she suggested, you're going to have your paneling and you're basically building your cabinetry and your paneling around the fridge to make it look like it's built in and gives it a nice, complete look. Um, sometimes you can pull the paneling and the cabinetry out just a little bit deeper above the fridge if you don't have the room to go into the wall. And that way it can feel like, you you know, you planned for it. It was it was intentional. Um, and then, of course, there is the built in refrigerator option. Um, not many fridges nowadays that are freestanding fridges allow you to put panels on the front of them. That used to be a common way to kind of make those fridges look a little more integrated in the past. It's just not nearly as common now. However, most manufacturers are now offering a counter depth refrigerator, which means that the case of the fridge is 24 inches deep to match your cabinets and that the doors are the only thing that stick out past the paneling or the, the cabinetry. Um, and so it looks um, more built in or semi built in as some people say. The one where we should have done. The next mistake to avoid is because you didn't know what to choose or because you were trying to save on money, you just went and got the ugliest granite at the granite yard. Sometimes I look at these houses and I'm like, why did they choose that granite? You're better off getting one of the manufactured stones that are really durable, that look kind of like marble. I would much prefer that look than just some strange puke colored marble that was discounted at the stone yard. Just don't do it. And sometimes it's because you're like, I didn't know what color to go or what to do and this one was cheap. I would say either go the manufactured stone if you're going for cost effective or save up and do what you really love or decide what you love. Don't just throw in what's ever available because that can, the stone makes a huge statement in your kitchen and choose that wisely. Okay, so choosing countertop material. Well, like anything, I totally agree with Christina here. Um, one of the important things to do is to gather your materials and colors in advance. Um, it is a bummer or problem when that material is no longer available after you've selected it, you're ready to actually get it um, fabricated. Um, oftentimes they will break off chunks of the granite slab to give to you to put with your materials. My suggestion, like any time you're choosing materials or colors, is take those and put those in the space where you're planning to use them. Have the lighting that you will plan to hit, use at the, in, you know, by the time the room is done, whether it's LED or mix of LED and, and halogen or fluorescent or incandescent or whatever the mix may be that you can see how the, the material looks in that setting. Um, so make sure that you're, you're looking at the samples and hopefully that helps you with your decision making. My next mistake to avoid is opt to get the pot filler. And if you look behind me, we didn't get a pot filler. And I'm not saying every kitchen actually needs a pot filler. The mistake to avoid isn't per se the pot filler, but that was something that when we did this kitchen renovation, my husband wanted it more than anything. And I just was like, how hard is it to walk around, fill up the pot with water? We're not making pasta every single night. We don't need a pot filler. And it was gonna be, I think about $2,000 more to run water to this wall to put it in. And I convinced him that it was unnecessary. And all the time he's like, we should have done the pot filler. It was only $2,000, we should have done it. So my advice to you is just choose what you love and do it and let your husband have that crazy idea or let your wife, if that's, if she wants these poles that are a little more expensive in the long run, in the grand scheme of the project, it's not gonna be that much more. I mean, at some point you have to stop. You can't do everything you wanna do potentially, but, 
if that's like the one thing you really, really wanted, which for my husband was the pot filler. And now we can't do it because the wall is here, it's too late. So I would urge you, if there's something that you would hope and dream to do, just do it and do it right the first time. Oh boy, yeah, the pot filler, huh? <laughs> A great, great concept um, in some settings. Um, you have to decide if it works for you. Let, let's just address the pot filler really quick for one. Um, it's great because you can um, obviously have your heavy pot, fill it up with water right there on your stove. The downside is, is unless you use all that water up or most of it, you're still going to have to, <clears throat> excuse me, carry that pot of water over to your sink to drain it. Unless you have a sink really close to your range that you've designed. Um, there was one company, I believe is a range and appliance company who tried to incorporate a sink in their range um, so that you could pour it right down the, the, the drain in the range, which is kind of interesting. Anyway, I don't know that it ever actually came to market, um, but those are some of the things we see as a designer behind the scenes that are being trying to be developed or invented to help make things better in the project. So Christina, great video. And, and I love the advice that she shares at the end, the end here. And, and guys, by the way, if, if you like what I'm doing, this type of um, format where I analyze videos and give you additional concepts, you know, I want to know, um, we'll, we'll only produce the videos that you guys like. Um, or we're trying to figure out what format is the best for that. As always, like a lot of other people who are producing content, if you find value in this, um, please let us know in the feedback, subscribe, you know how it works um, at this point. So, but primarily to end the video, she talks about avoiding mistakes. So I would just, or not avoiding, you can't ever decide all the things that you want up front. Um, find a way to make your decisions, solidify those decisions and move forward. Um, sometimes get as much feedback and ideas as you can from designers, professionals and experts. Um, analyze costs, analyze practicality and how well it works for you, the way that you use your kitchen. Thanks so much for watching.